Hi, I'm Vinny Catalano and welcome back. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Phil Orlando. Phil is a CFA charter holder. He is Chief of Market Strategist, or Chief Equity Strategist. Chief Excuse Equity me. Strategist. Chief Equity Strategist at Federated Investors. And we're going to explore a couple of things here uh, with uh, Phil today that'll be, I think everybody will find rather interesting. We'll tap into his knowledge and expertise uh, being around the block here for a little while. Phil, welcome. Thanks for having me, Vinny. Thank you. Uh, what I would like to start off talking about uh, with you, Phil, is uh, cheese. I want to talk about cheese. I happen to know that you like to go to a fancy Italian restaurants here in New York, that you like to have your chunks of Parmesan cheese. That you is like true. You like to have lots of cheese on your, your pasta meals and all that, but also that you're one of the big cheeses over at Federated. <laughs> so what I thought everybody would benefit from is how you do what you do at Federated, how do you go about your whole process, your day? What, what's a typical day for a chief equity strategist? Sure. So uh, aside from being the chief equity strategist, I also chair our macroeconomic policy committee and our asset allocation committee, and I serve as the uh, senior portfolio manager on the uh, uh, the Federated Global Allocation Fund and, and run the balance team. So the uh, the hallmark of Federated, I think, is the is the very collaborative nature of of the firm. We manage uh, in round numbers, about $400 billion in assets uh, with that money spread across money markets and fixed income and equities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm the chief equity strategist, uh, but in my capacity as the allocation guy and the macro policy guy, uh, I'm working with uh, my colleagues literally across the firm. So uh, I guess if you're to look for one thread as to how I do what I do, uh, I'm reasonably certain that I don't have uh, any of the answers to any of the questions, <laughs> uh, but we've got a lot of smart people, and, right. and I try to sort of herd them all together and uh, develop uh, a mosaic in terms of what we as a firm right. uh, think are best practices. Excellent, like a maestro. Exactly. Okay, that's terrific. Well, I want to get to that aspect of it uh, in a moment, but I, I first want to touch on the area dealing with the, the change structure of the financial markets. Uh, Michael Lewis's book is out now, Flash Boys, and this is something that I've written about and talked about, and we've even discussed on a number of occasions uh, at events here at the New York Society, and that is the fact that this is no longer your grandfather's stock market any longer. So let's talk a little bit about that. How does that impact what you do as a more, if you don't mind my saying, a, a more traditional investment uh, manager? Sure. So uh, I've been in the business now for 33 years, so I guess I've seen a lot of change uh, over that period of time. Mm -hmm. So what had been uh, the environment uh, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, you might consider sleepy compared to what we're looking <laughs> at sure. right now. Yeah. So uh, the, the business of investing has, has grown exponentially. Uh, it's not just a, a, a domestic environment right now, it's, it's global, so cool. that's a, an important change, number one. Um, number two, uh, everyone is investing, or, or I should qualify that. In the United States, at least, the, the top half of America uh, owns, uh, owns stocks in some capacity, uh, college savings plans, retirement plans, mm -hmm. or whatever. So we've got a population of uh, a little over 300 million people, which means that you've got a 150 million Americans sure. that are investing in stocks. Uh, the uh, the Either game directly or indirectly. Correct, exactly. Right. Uh, through 401k program, uh, uh, pension plan, uh, uh, retirement assets in some capacity, sure. and, uh, and also with ETFs uh, as well, which has made it made it quick and easy and relatively inexpensive. So mm -hmm. that that change has been a positive one. Uh, you've got a much more institutional market now because of that. Right. A lot of individuals may not own stocks directly. Your point mm -hmm. is a valid one. Uh, it could be beneficial ownership that uh, right. you know through investment in a in a federated mutual fund or or you know any other excellent companies uh, mm -hmm. you know like federated. 
and and uh, speed uh, has certainly uh, uh, taken on much more importance as we saw from uh, Michael Lewis's uh, uh, recent book and, and sure. recent appearance on uh, uh, on 60 Minutes. Well, what I'm trying to get to here is has that changed the the nature of the game as far as you're concerned? Is it something that you try to take advantage of? Is it something that is a disruptive force that has certain benefits but also certain unintended consequences that come from it from your perspective? The, the reality from our perspective is that that's not a game that we're trying to play. Right. That, that we certainly know that it's out there, but we're not, we're not running fast money, we're not running hedge fund money. Uh, we are uh, what you might consider more of a, a, a traditional buy and hold kind of a shop. Now mm -hmm. there are certainly wrinkles. Uh, in our global allocation fund, for example, uh, uh, we do some shorting. Uh, that's something that that most mutual funds uh, didn't do years past. But okay. uh, there are there are some products, some funds that do that sort of thing right now. But for the most part, what we're trying to do is get get the macro right uh, in terms of economic trends, political trends, interest rates, central bank policy, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, try to understand uh, what's going on with uh, uh, economic and corporate growth, and try to identify the sectors of the marketplace that, that are potentially undervalued right. or mispriced uh, based upon those trends that we see. Exactly, and, and the things that are happening in terms of the, uh, the changed market structure in some respects might be viewed as noise? Well, it could be noise, but sometimes it also creates uh, opportunities. opportunities right. uh, a situation uh, just recently, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve was doing their, uh, uh, their stress tests. Uh, okay. And a couple of those banks uh, uh, did not pass, uh, but there was only one bank that didn't pass because of uh, quote unquote fundamental reasons. Uh, there was another major bank, uh, who I won't mention, uh, that okay. was failed uh, for what we learned were uh, more political issues than fundamental issues, and the stock uh, declined by about six or seven percent. So uh, I was sitting next to uh, Bill Miller. Uh, legendary uh, value investor right. uh, on a panel uh, last week in Ohio uh, when uh, this news had just broken mm -hmm. and uh, the moderator asked uh, asked the panel what they thought about this situation and Bill Miller said well I, I wasn't invested in this company uh, up until now but uh, we think that the 7% correction is, yeah, is not for not. fundamental reasons sure. we're, we're going to take a look at it now right, right, uh, and, and so sometimes that noise sometimes that speed sure create some irrationality in the marketplace and that might create a, an opportunity for, okay. for an investment. Now we have a limited amount of time left so just if you don't mind quickly in this point you mentioned before about the markets being the global the economy is a, on, a, on a global basis how do, how do you go about managing that? How do you go about deciding you know measuring a, a really what in effect is a, you know a global economic environment a global market environment and then in terms of you know the whole decision making aspect of it how do you, how do you do that sure so what we've done in our portfolio is have attempted to marry three disciplines uh, I, I'm more of a qualitative guy macro fundamental bottoms up uh, my co-manager uh, Tim Goodger has a PhD in quantitative economics from North Carolina okay he looks at the world through a very different prism a quantitative yeah, yeah. prism that's excellent so, so he's developed a series of very sophisticated very robust models and then uh, the third discipline is that we've got a very uh, a significant risk overlay on this process so what we're trying to do is marry those three disciplines there you go. The, the the key issue is that um, a quantitative analysis, for example, is fine with capturing uh, uh, imbalances within the middle part of the cycle. Let's call it that 80%. But it's those inflection points that, that models don't work. You sure. can throw them out. So the, the qualitative guys, the, the fundamental you know, uh, back of the envelope guys uh, tend to have a better sense of, of what's happening at those changes. Mm -hmm. So when you marry those two disciplines and have uh, sort of a risk overlay over that process, by and large you, you, you get more right than you get wrong. And so it's a, it's a good way to not rely upon just one set of tools that may not work. Excellent. Uh, any technical analysis done? I, I am a closet technician, uh, so uh, take out the ruler and crayons when necessary. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Phil. I hope you found this to be informative and, uh, to a large extent, also educational, which is the thrust of uh, parts of these uh, interviews that we are doing here. Thanks so much, Phil. Thanks, Vinny. Thank you.